Hey, let's talk about philosophy. You know, there's so much stuff that we could talk about, but, uh, you know, even with, you know, Ayn Rand philosophy in that direction, educate me, man. What, what's this all about? We hear this all the time at the 21 Convention. We see it as an ongoing theme, but we don't always connect it to all the paleo stuff, diet stuff, you know, lifestyle dating. Yeah. You know, where does this play into it? Um, I mean, so Ayn Rand was a 20th century novelist and philosopher. She wrote, I mean, dozens of books and famous books, Atlas Shrugged, The Fountainhead, mm -hmm. a lot of people have probably heard of. Right. Uh, and the, I think the connection, it's interesting, the, the 21 convention that I did a couple years ago about the idea of self, uh, the idea of the self-made man. I mean, Ayn Rand really taps into that American ideal uh, in her novels, in her characters. Uh, a, a number of her characters and even just the idea that she presents of, of, of the whole person is really that you are a being, as she said, of the self-made soul. So it's really that you're not just a self-made man in the material sense, in the physical sense, but all aspects of your being are really about your control, your improvement, what you do for yourself. And so that whole thing kind of ties into all these areas that people want to improve their lives. It's all about taking conscious control and doing that for your life, which she identified what the philosophic roots of that were. Did you want to? Yeah, I mean, so the, if you can think about it this way, she viewed philosophy as, in effect, the ultimate self-help guide. So a lot of, like, self-improvement stuff is scattered. You know, it's a bunch of different ideas. And what philosophy is really doing is right. giving you an integrated view of the world and of human life and how to achieve human potential. And it's doing it with rigor. So it's, it's saying, not just here's some thoughts I had, but we need to be able to prove this is the basic nature of reality. This is how we achieve reliable knowledge. And this is what a moral, successful life looks like. Mm -hmm. And so it's basically allowing you to have a consistent framework rather than just a grab bag of ideas that might clash with one another and not fit together. And, an, and a framework that's true, that's connected to reality so that you can actually achieve your goals and success in reality. You know, this is, uh, this is like such an interesting thing because where she came from and where she was speaking from, I think, is very relevant and uh, this is this is gonna kind of have a little bit of a curveball but I you know always loved art I loved cinema I loved theater and one thing that came around with the advent of communism and all that stuff was like this really really good art before they killed them all right yeah. but like but no I mean it was <laughs> yeah. like some of the cinema best plays opposite. like yeah. like all yeah. cinema derives yeah. from like you know Eisenstein stuff yeah. and it's just like yeah. Battleship at Temkin, it was like, you know, you know, it, it was like, finally we can speak and have a voice, and then it just spun into the, you yeah. know, this like distorted yeah. thing. But she came from, you know, the, the rejection of those things. And could you guys speak a little bit about the history of how that? Yeah, yeah, she was originally born in Russia in the Tsarist period. So yeah. she was born in uh, 1905 when the Tsar still ruled Russia, and that, and that kind of cultural, yeah. that cultural thing was still there where, where many Russians were looking to the West and they were innovating, they were doing different things. There was a large French influence. I mean, Russia was very tied mm. into to Western ideas. Wow. And then and she you don't, yeah, yeah and you so don't, cool yeah, I mean, and, 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 you know, the communists wiped that all away. So she grew up and basically as a teenager saw the Bolshevik Revolution. And her family was uh, thrown out of its business. They tried to flee to the Crimea while the Civil War was going on. And ultimately, when the Bolsheviks won, when Lenin won, and the Soviets took over, she basically went back to what was then uh, Leningrad and lived until the 1920s when she basically escaped. I mean, she well, she petitioned to have a visa yeah. to, to leave to go to the United States to visit relatives, which the Soviets allowed, but she knew all along that she would never go back because she yeah. knew she was one of those people that the Soviets couldn't tolerate. Her ideas already, by the time she was in her teens and early 20s, completely rejected the idea of collectivism, rejected the idea of you know this forced state of, of this collectivist ideal, and she knew that she was going to get into trouble with that. She was actually, it's interesting that you mentioned it, she was a huge, huge fan of cinema. Mm -hmm. That was actually the ideal that she had. She came to America because she wanted to work in movies. Really? Yeah, and then when she got to America, she first went to Chicago and then eventually made her way out to Hollywood. It's a really interesting story. Really? She, yeah, she made her way out to Hollywood, and get this. She goes and just is trying to find work, doesn't speak great English, and goes to a movie set, and you know, because that's where the movies are made, <laughs> and she's waiting at the gate, and Cecil B. DeMille actually drives off the, wow. the studio lot and sees her, and he's like, hey, you know, you look interesting. Like, you're not the average sort yeah, of American yeah, yeah. woman just sitting there. So he gives her a ride, 
and she connects up, and then he gives her like you know a, a basic job. I don't know if Don, if you remember what what job she gets. She's just like a basic job and extra things like that. Starts working, ultimately starts oh, wow, yeah, ultimately crazy. starts that's working crazy. in costume departments, wow. and then and then screenwriting, and then you know there's a number of movies actually now that that were based on some of her screenplays. Wow. So she basically worked her way up through Hollywood, and then and then decided to turn her attention to writing novels, and then ultimately after the novels into writing philosophy. So. The, the it's crazy because one of the most prolific filmmakers of that time, and I forget her name, was uh, was a female. Yeah, and, and that's yeah. so rare. In, in Ayn Rand, female, you yeah. don't see that yeah. as a as a philosopher, as a yeah. writer, as a as a massive producer yeah. and cultural influence. Yeah, um, dude, that's that's nuts. I, yeah, man, it's that's, really that's, yeah. That's, she's got yeah, she's really, cool. yeah. She's got a really interesting biography. I mean, she worked in RKO Studios for a while. Wow. Um, uh, King Vidor uh, was he was the producer of the the Fountainhead movie, I think, and. So yeah, she had all kinds of Hollywood connections back in the day, and uh, you know, was actually you know so so connected in Hollywood, so to speak, that she actually was uh, she actually testified before the House on American Activities Committee along with you know Bogart and all these other people um, that wow. and Ely Weasel and all you know all, the, all these other people that that were involved in Hollywood at the time. So she was really plugged in uh, to the movie.